I had one more thing to say about the limits of Turing machines. And um, this is something that is, is near and dear to my heart. I actually really like this. Um, uh, what I want to talk about may be, I was thinking about this earlier today, may be my favorite number. Sometimes people ask me like, oh, you're a mathematician? You're a numbers guy, right? And I'm like, no, nah, not really. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't get too excited about numbers in general, I guess. Uh, and sometimes people ask me what my favorite number is, and I think that's a silly question. Um, and I say, I don't know, what's your favorite number? And they're like, oh, my favorite number is one, because it's like so, so uh, simple and tall and slender. That, what? That, I don't think of, the, like you're thinking about a font, not about a number. But, but anyway, I'm not here to judge those people. Um, but uh, actually, what I, so what I want to talk about today is, um, well, you'll see where it comes to uh, numbers and, and a number in particular. Um, as we saw last time, no Turing machine can um, decide the halting problem. Halting problem. No Turing machine can decide the halting problem. That is to say, uh, given M hashtag X, where M is some kind of string representation of a Turing machine, and X is an input string, can we decide whether or not M halts with input X? The best you can do is run a simulation of M with that input, which you definitely can do. And if that halts, you will know because your simulation will halt. But if your simulation runs forever, you will never be sure that it's going to run forever because you can't tell the difference while it's running between something which is going to run forever versus something which is just taking a long time and maybe will stop eventually. This is kind of an intuitive reason why you should feel like, the, or you should believe at least a simulation is not sufficient to uh, answer the question of whether or not something's going to halt. You'll notice when it does halt, but if it's not halting, you don't know if that's because it's never going to or because it just has not halted yet. All right. No Turing machine can decide the halting problem. Um, this last time I phrased in terms of languages which can be accepted. So that I wrote this sort of L sub H is the language of the halting problem. And that is an example of a language which is not recursive. Um, but we can also phrase this in terms of uh, Turing computable functions, which is like what the quiz was about. Another way of saying this stuff, no Turing machine can decide the halting problem, um, we can turn this into an uncomputable function. That is a mathematical function which can never be computed by a Turing machine. So we can turn this into a function. And it's not, not really hard to do if I have some function which takes m hashtag x as the input and then basically I just want a machine which decides whether or not this halts and of course that's impossible but I'm going to define the function like this it is supposed to have the answer of well let's say the answer is going to be 1 if uh, m halts on x and 0 if m does not halt on x So I imagine a Turing machine which would take this big string as its input, a machine, as a representation of a, of a Turing machine followed by an input string. It would do a bunch of stuff and then eventually uh, stop with a 1 on the tape if that machine M halts on X and a 0 on the tape if M does not halt on X. All right, This is a real function but it cannot be computed by any Turing machine just because this decision the question of does it halt or not, that's not something that a Turing machine is, is capable of deciding. So this F is not Turing computable. This is an example of a function which you cannot compute on a Turing machine. Another way of, just a more simple way of saying that is you, there's no computer that can do this. right? 
Uh, it's natural to wonder, does that mean like people can't do it either? Um, this, this is sort of a philosophical question, but more or less, yeah. It, uh, it kind of means that people can't do it either, unless you think that a person has access to some kind of magical uh, process that Turing machines can't do, all right? Um, you might wonder, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole like I did last time. Like, uh, can God solve the halting problem? I don't know if you ever wondered about that. Um, I don't care if you believe in God or not, but let's just, for the sake of argument, can God solve the halting problem? You want to say, yeah, because, I mean, that's the whole point of God, is that God can do anything, right? But um, if that's true, I suppose it means that whatever, reason, whatever process God uses to solve the halting problem is not analogous to anything that we would recognize as like reason. Or, like God can't use an algorithm to solve the halting problem. If, if God can do it, just some God, God stuff. God, like that requires God level stuff. You can't do it just by step-by-step uh, -step reasoning, apparently. That's kind of weird. problem with our reasoning yeah I mean I think the the conclusion is just like algorithms are not necessarily all that when it comes to deciding if things are true or not like there are there are, I mean I suppose it's the best we got but there are limitations to what algorithms can uh, can deduce um, and this is either troubling to you or comforting to you. I, like on a certain level like I said last time I, I'm, a, I'm a person of, of some amount of faith on a certain level, it is encouraging to me as a person of faith to know that algorithms are not capable of, of deciding everything. You know, that, I don't know how you feel about that. Whatever. I didn't mean to get into that, all that again. Um, you can actually turn this question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, you don't? No. Stretching. All right. Um, you can turn this, stretch on. Um, Turn this weird function of strings actually into a more ordinary looking um, mathematical function. Check it out. So I want to talk briefly about something. This has a name on it. And I'm not, I'm sorry, but I'm not quite sure how this is supposed to be pronounced. Kaitins is how I'm going to say it. Uh, halting probability. This is the kind of thing you can tell your friends about. Tell your moms, tell your pops when you go home for, uh, for the summer. Um, halting probability. Uh, here, here's the idea. I'm going to define a function which is actually um, a function of ordinary numbers. And actually, its answer is going to be a real number. So this is uh, natural numbers. You plug in, and you get a real number. And here's the definition, f of n. To define f of n, I'm going to consider, this is much more down to earth than about Turing machines. I want to consider specifically all strings of length n using some alphabet. Let's just say the ASCII alphabet, which is the standard computer alphabet consisting of um, Roman letters and number digits and spaces and other, like what, what you see on a typical keyboard is the ASCII alphabet. Consider all strings of length n um, and count how many of these strings, think of these as like really big strings which have like um, new line characters in them, they might have tabs in them or whatever, those are all part of the ASCII character set. And you count how many of them make um, legal Python programs that you could actually run. Python programs that halt. All right. So do you consider all possible strings of length, you know, uh, 20, say. This would be, if I wanted to figure out what is f of 20, you consider all strings of length 20, which th there are very, very many of them, um, and then you count how many of them make legal Python programs that actually halt. I would say, proportionally speaking, not many. Most of them are going to be complete gibberish because you're considering all possible strings. But some of them will be real Python programs that, that actually halt. All right. Um, and f of n is defined to be 
the number of halting programs of length n divided by the number of all strings of length n. All right. And this is a proportion. It's called the halting probability because you can think of this, this represents like what percentage of every random string is actually a legal Python program that halts um, of, of, among strings of length n. So this represents in a little less formal language. This is the percentage of strings of length n which represent uh, legal Python programs that halt. I keep on saying Python. It doesn't really matter what language you do this in, although these numbers will be slightly different if you're measuring how many, uh, how many of these random strings are legal Python versus how many of these random strings are legal Java. I mean, you can do both. You'll get slightly different answers. But anyway, these are the percentage of strings of length n which represent legal programs that halt. Yes? Is some like the halting problem in this whole thing? Wouldn't this be impossible to calculate if you don't know how many things halt? That's right. This, uh, this fraction, so for, for specific values of n, you might be able to calculate this. Like, for instance, if n was 3, I would, uh, can you calculate f of 3? You, you probably could. How many, if you consider all possible strings of length 3, how many of those represent legal Python programs? Maybe none of them, or I think in Python you are allowed to just have like a bare constant. I think that will run through the Python interpreter. I'm not sure of that. I mean, uh, it could be a comment. That would certainly be legal. So, but you could, you could measure for small values of n. So I would say um, individual, individual, individual values f of n could be computed, say, for small n. But it is a fact. No algorithm can compute uh, all of Fn. Like there is no possible algorithm that can compute all the values. Where you, you for example, you cannot program a computer to say I'm gonna I'm gonna type in what the n is and then it tells me what this probability is. No algorithm can compute. Uh, all the values of this function. You might be able to do it in special cases, but not, not for all of them, all right? So what that means is we can consider this as, check this out, is a sequence of uh, real numbers, right? Each of them is a fraction where, which represents the probability or the uh, percentage of programs of this length which halts. This is a sequence of real numbers which is uncomputable. That is, there is no algorithm that can actually spit out these numbers one after another. You cannot make a computer to do this. Uh, this is kind of, I don't know if this is surprising to you at this point. I, I can remember being at least slightly impressed by this fact when I first heard it because I sort of, in my experience as a programmer, I kind of have in the back of my mind this idea that, well, you can make a computer to do more or less anything by brute force. In the worst case, you just make it like check everything and spit out the answers. Even that is not going to work in this case. No possible algorithm can do this. Um, it is, this sequence of numbers is uncomputable. Like I said, you might be able to compute a few of them, but you're not going to be able to compute uh, all of them indefinitely. All right, and um, I, I said I was going to tell you about my favorite number. I know that not all of you have taken real analysis yet, but if you have, you will notice this sequence actually, if you think about it, um, this sequence is more or less a decreasing sequence because as I consider larger and larger random strings, the probability, if I generate for you a random string of, of, of a thousand characters, what are the chances that that's a legal Python program? It's basically zero, right? 
Um, and as the string gets longer and longer, the probability that it is a legal program that halts is, is decreasing. So actually, this sequence is decreasing. and bounded below by zero. Like all of those individual numbers are, are fractions. They are percentages. How is it uncomputable? Yeah. The sequence? Because in order to compute this sequence, it would, be, it would be necessary to have a procedure for deciding if, if programs halt or not. And that's not possible. Yeah. So this sequence is decreasing and bounded below by zero. So it converges. This is the, um, well, really, it has a convergence subsequence. No, it's decreasing. So it, this is the monotone convergence theorem from real analysis. I don't know if you know about that. It converges, though, to a specific number. It does not converge to zero, though. Because in um, all of these numbers, uh, there, there, there is a non-zero probability that a random program will be, uh, will be a, that a random string will be a valid program. For instance, all strings which begin with the comments, how do you make a comment in Python? Two, two slashes? The hashtag? I don't know, whatever. Anyway, there's always a, you know, the ASCII uh, character set has, I don't know how many, 128 characters in it. There's always some one over 128 is the probability that the first character is a hashtag, and in that case, the whole thing is a comment, and every, and, it, and it's legal. So this is a non-zero, a specific number greater than zero. I see you there. Just a moment, and it's called. It's generally written as a capital omega, and this is a specific number. This is called the halting probability. Always the same no, for different programming languages, this number will be slightly different. Oh, okay. But for any programming language, this number exists and is not zero. And it represents the probability that a random string is actually a legal code in this language. It's very close to zero because a random string is probably not going to be legal. but. Um, it is close to zero. I mean, if it converges to something higher than zero, it's zero. Okay, it's not equal zero. I mean, when I say it's close to zero, I mean like in, in ordinary parlance, this is a small number. This number is not like a third. It's more like one over a billion or something. Like, one over a billion. Hmm? Is it one over a billion? Yes. If for example, this is Python A, it starts with a hashtag. Okay, yeah, so that could be one over, one over the probability that that character is, is, a, is the hashtag, yeah. And that none of the other characters are new lines. I mean, it's a little complicated, but yeah. Another. So why, like, is the sequence decreasing? Why is that character? Is there more of a chance that there will be, or less of a chance that it will be legal? I believe that the sequence is decreasing just because... Uh, if you make, I, I would say, every new character you add on to this is likely to mess up your, your code and turn it into oh. some gibberish. So right. if you give me a million characters, there's almost no chance that that's a if real it's not, program. Yeah. If it's not decreasing, then the chance of ending uh, the string up to, to one would have been one greater Yeah. Yeah, it's a little complicated because you could have a, a piece of code which is not legal, but then you add something onto it and it becomes legal. Yeah, this is not likely. Yeah. Anyway, another question? Right. That's what I was kind of thinking. Just like, if you add more characters, does that just like make it a greater chance of being legal? I think. 
I don't think that it really does make it. I mean, there are there are some some strings which were illegal, but they become legal because you added something onto them. I think there are far more strings that were were legal but become illegal. Okay. Right. I, I don't know. But anyway, can I just say what I love about this? This is a number, a specific real number. It's not zero, but because of the way that this is constructed, so this is a real number, but the digits of this number are uncomputable. There can be no... Uh, essentially what this means is this is a number whose actual value is unknowable to, um, to, to people or to, to anyone who reasons algorithmically. All right? It is... Um, this is called... This constant is an uncomputable number. This is something that I've tried to talk to people about from time to time, and I find that people have a very hard way of grasping this, this concept. Uh, sometimes when I tell someone that I'm a mathematician, uh, a lot of people have no concept of the, the idea that like people these days are still doing new mathematics. So like, what, what do you like, discover some new number? And I say, well, not really. I mean, but there's plenty of new things to discover in mathematics. Um, but they're like, and then they're like, well, yeah, I guess we already know everything about all the numbers. And I, from time to time, gauging sort of how loud the music is in the club, I might try to say, sometimes I mention this to people like, did you know actually there are numbers? We know that they exist, but actually it's impossible to say exactly what they are. Like this is an example of that. Um, you can prove that this, this exists as a real number, but uh, you can also prove that there can be no procedure to compute the digits of this number. You might be able to compute the first few of them, which, which will be zeros, actually. It will be zero point, zero, many, many zeros, but eventually it's not, the number is not zero. The digits are uncomputable. Very, uh, very strange and interesting to me. Um, here, I will say just one more thing about this. Uh, this has to do with probabilities that, that certain strings, um, well, let me, let me just say, no algorithm can compute the digits of omega. This also might make more sense to someone who has uh, taken a real analysis. But uh, when you take real analysis, you will learn that um, there are, uh, there are different sizes of infinity. Maybe you've heard about this even if you haven't taken real analysis, but there is sort of the, the small type of infinity. It's called countable infinity, and that represents the size of the, uh, the natural numbers. Uh, but the size of the real numbers is larger than that. That's, they call it the uh, uncountable infinity. It's the size of the real numbers. Um, there are only countably many rationals uh, in, inside the set of real numbers, which means it, there's a very fundamental sense in which there are more irrational numbers than there are rational numbers because the number of irrationals is uncountable. But check it out. No algorithm can compute the digits of omega. This might get you to wondering, well, what, what numbers can be computed by algorithms? And the answer is, well, for starters, every number that you've ever heard of can be computed by algorithms. Like, I can tell you an algorithm that computes the digits of the number three. It is, first you say three, and then you say zero forever. That's, that computes the digits of the number three, right? But which numbers are actually computable? Um, it turns out, this is not a, not a huge surprise, although we don't typically think of things in this way. Um, there are only, there are only, countably many possible algorithms for anything. I have to explain countable? Take real analysis. Yeah, I know, I know that this is, this is not uh, terminology that, uh, that a lot of people are, are familiar with. Uh, but countably many means the, the total number of algorithms that could possibly exist is, it is infinite but it's infinite in the same way that the, the natural numbers are infinite. They go, they go one after another. Um, 
it is not infinite in the same way that the real, the real numbers are, are more infinite. Anyway, there are only countably many possibly al possible algorithms. That's because every algorithm can be expressed as a string written in Python or whatever. And there are only countably many different strings that you can make. There's infinitely many, but, but it's a countable amount. And so what that means is, so only countably many computable numbers because there's only countably many algorithms in the first place. So there are only countably many real numbers that you can compute at all. So uncountably many uncomputable real numbers. And I'm sorry if this is not making sense to everybody. The take home from this is most real numbers are uncomputable. The ones which can actually be computed, um, there's, only, there's only a small amount of those ones. Most real numbers that exist are like omega in that they, are, they, are, they do exist, we can prove that they exist, but no, um, there can be no procedure to actually compute their, their digits. Strange but true. Pi is computable because you can, it's not so hard to write a computer program to generate digits of pi. So what, I mean, you should wonder like, what, what else am I talking about then, if not numbers like pi? Um, what's interesting about pi is that the digits don't repeat or something like that. Um, I'm talking about numbers which don't have names and cannot have values. Like they are numbers that are permanently sort of unknowable to us. Um, we, can, we can define some of them like omega. You can, you can describe what it is, but you can't actually compute what it is. Yeah, very strange. But th what's the strangest of all is just, I'm, t I'm here to tell you, most numbers are like that. The, all the, every number that you've ever heard of is part of a small group of numbers which are actually describable by algorithms. Uh, most of the numbers are not. Yes. So there's like an impossible many, num many amount of numbers that like we can't do anything. With. Yeah, like we sort of can't have no way of like perceiving them. I mean, the <laughs> yeah. Like another way to say this, it's not equivalent, but between any two real numbers there are infinitely many uncomputable numbers. They are. That's still countable. The number of fractions, yeah. That's, those are rationals, which are countable. A question? Uh, she said, yeah, I think the answer is no. She said, could there be any other technology that, that might compute numbers such as this? I think what, what that would require is some, some technology which does computations, but not in a way that a Turing machine does. And I th Yeah, I mean, the, uh, you've probably heard of quantum computers, which, which have a fundamentally different way of of engaging the computation, but actually it has been shown that quantum computers have the same capabilities as Turing machines. They're just, the difference is, is a matter of efficiency, but it, um, you can simulate a quantum computer using a Turing machine, so that, that won't cut it. I suppose if it turns out, and this is the case with quantum computers, if it turns out that the laws of physics are like fundamentally different from what we think they are, which is what quantum that's how quantum came about. It, everyone discovered that actually physics worked differently. And it was discovered that this like fluke in physics allows you to make a new type of computer. So I, I mean, I suppose it's possible that physics is at some very base level different from the way we think it is. And those differences might be exploitable in a computer. I, I mean, that's, to me, that doesn't seem like it. But who, what do I know? I'm not a physicist. So exactly, so there's like 
I somehow had like a wrong part of physics. Some... There's a wrong part of physics? Like, is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying like quantum quantum mechanics allows for new computers just because when for instance, when Turing came up with his ideas, he didn't know about quantum mechanics. And so it, it didn't occur to him to try to make a computer based on these other weird quantum effects in the real world. But once people learned about the existence of these quantum effects, we re realized that they could be turned into a new type of computer. And I'm just saying, if you want to compute these numbers, your, your only bet is to like ask God to do it for you or like discover some kind of new laws of physics which which somehow make it possible. Yeah. It is not possible with with uh, with our current understanding of the universe. We got one minute on the clock. I was going to say something about the final, although maybe it's uh, maybe it's a little too late for that. But you know, everything's on the final. Um, when is the exam? I think it's ten fifty. All right. It will be in this room. And the, uh, I should say, the exam is scheduled for three hours, as always. I'm not going to try to make this into a three-hour test, but you will have the three hours. Um, I'll probably make it maybe one and a half times the length of the ones we've had in class. But uh, like I said, I'll give you the three hours to do it in. See you, too. So everything's on it. Would you say that if you study all the homework, would be good for it? Yeah, I would say look, go back and look at the homeworks and the quizzes if you still have them. That would be a good, uh, a good way to prepare. May 10th, yeah.